as concluded in accordance with standing order 43 the time for member statements has just concluded the prime minister with ministerial arrangements thank you mr speaker as i'm sure honourable members are aware the uh, minister for home affairs has resigned from the ministry uh, i want to thank him for his service uh, and uh, members doing an on excellent left. job as minister and I advise the house the treasurer will answer questions asked in the home affairs portfolio during question time the Leader of the Opposition on indulgence as well. Uh, Mr Speaker, for the information of the House, I present a revised list of the Shadow Ministry. Thank the Leader of the Opposition. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. The Member, oh, I was going to read it out. The member for oh, Barton sorry, will the become the, the Shadow Minister for Families and Social Services. The Member for Chifley will add the Shadow Minister for Human Services to his existing responsibilities as Shadow Minister for the Digital Economy. Along with her responsibilities as Shadow Minister for Young Australians and Youth Affairs, the, the member for Griffith will take on the role of Shadow Minister for Employment Services, Workforce Participation and Future of Work. Yeah. Senator Jenny McAllister will be promoted to the position as Shadow Assistant Minister for Families and Communities. Senator Louise Pratt will take on the position of Shadow Assistant Minister for Universities and Shadow Minister for Equality. On behalf of my united Labor team, I congratulate my colleagues on their new positions. Members on my right, the Leader of the House. Questions without notice, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Given that nearly half of his parliamentary colleagues, including seven of his ministers, have today expressed a lack of confidence in the Prime Minister, how can the Prime Minister claim to have any mandate to govern this country? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. The, uh, <coughs> the mandate uh, uh, our government has came from the 2016 election. Remember that? We won and you lost. Mr. Speaker, we're delivering. We're delivering. We're delivering Members on lower on taxes, left. more jobs, and stronger economic growth. We're delivering on lower energy prices. Because what we're doing is standing up for the Australian people the Labor Party has abandoned. The Labor Party used to claim that it was in favour of giving people a chance to get ahead. They used to believe, Member for Cowan, they used to believe in aspiration until it became a mystery to her colleague on the front bench here. The fact of the matter is we are delivering strong economic growth faster than any of the G7 economies, record jobs growth, lower taxes, more investment more investment in essential services than ever before, and we are turning the corner on energy prices, bringing them down. Labor, on the other hand, wants higher taxes, higher energy prices, less employment, less investment, slower economic growth and lower wages. That would be the consequence of a Labor government. The member for Shortland is warned, and I'm just going to caution Members, with the obvious caution, um, the level of noise is far too high, and I uh, will take action under 94A without warning if I deem fit. I particularly caution the members for Bendigo, Bass, and Braddon, and I call the member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on the actions the government is taking to reduce power prices, back Australian jobs? and deliver for families, including in my electorate of Dunkley. Is the Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has to call Thank members the on the left. member for his question. Uh, Mr Speaker, the government is backing Australian jobs and standing up for Australian families. We have taken strong action on energy with measures that are reducing retail prices. We've seen them coming the down in the last quarter. We hauled the big retailers in and demanded that they deliver a fair deal for their customers, and they contacted hundreds of thousands of their customers, told them they were on the wrong deal and gave them the opportunity to get onto the right one. And customers were able to save hundreds of dollars and took that up. And what we've also done is ensured that the companies that own the poles and wires are not able to keep on gaming the system to, to uh, increase the rate at which they charge customers for that uh, investment. 
We've succeeded in doing that by removing the ability to keep on appealing. Now, we have further to go. We've got more to do. And so, 15 months ago, the Treasurer Commission, the uh, consumer watchdog, the ACCC, to look rigorously and deeply and thoroughly into these problems problem of high retail electricity prices. And his report has recommended a number of vital measures which we are taking up. Now, Mr. Speaker, we're going to take up his suggestion uh, of directing the energy regulator to create a new benchmark price, a new default price, and that will be monitored by the ACCC and the regulator to ensure that savings are being passed on to customers. Now, Mr. Speaker, what that means is that instead of people falling onto standing offers, which are often very, very high and result in them paying hundreds of dollars more than they need to, there will be one default offer. We, we are advised by the ACCC this will save 1.2 million consumers up to $416 a year and small and medium businesses up to just under $1,500 a year. Now, that is a result of a report by the ACCC which we commissioned. And we're also going to ensure that the ACCC has the measures, the means to ensure the big companies do the right thing by their customers. And we are prepared to have them ordered to divest parts of their business in order to stop cartels and monopolistic behaviour that is jacking up electricity prices and not protecting the interests of the consumers, the people, the, co the companies are meant to serve. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that only yesterday he admitted that just one government member is enough to prevent the government introducing legislation into the parliament? And can he confirm today almost half of his Liberal colleagues voted against him remaining Australia's Prime Minister? And does he recognise now that a clear majority of the members of parliament behind him and in front of him no longer want him to be Prime Minister of Australia? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, well I, thank, uh, I thank the honourable member for his question. I see uh, the member for Grainle has got his hand up. Uh, he's the people's choice. Last time there was a leadership ballot in the Labor Party, he got 60, 60 per cent, 60 per cent of the support. Mr Speaker, the reality is that the Leader of the Opposition has failed the test of defending the interests of Australian families. He's had the opportunity to vote for lower taxes. And what did he do? He wanted to vote for higher taxes. Prime Minister, he just resume his seat for a second. The members for Burt and Bass will both leave under 94A. The Prime Minister has the call. Average IQ increase. <laughs> the Prime Minister has the call. Well, there you go, Mr Speaker. Just a moment ago, he, uh, he, uh, he said uh, two, of the, um, two of them have gone. Just a moment ago, he said there are all these people over there. There are two of them, all these people over there who, uh, who didn't want me to be Prime Minister. Well, now there's two less. You see, Bill, they're whittling, you're whitt your team's the whittling Prime themselves down. The Prime Minister will refer to members Mr. by their correct titles. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when the Leader of the Opposition had the opportunity to vote for lower taxes, he voted for higher taxes. When he had the opportunity to support lower energy prices, he's continued to opt for higher energy prices. When he had the opportunity to support stronger economic growth, he failed to do so. Having in previous parliaments advocated lower business taxes, he now opposes any reduction in business taxes. The Leader of the Opposition has failed to do the fundamental point that an opposition leader should deliver on, which is an alternative economic agenda. He has none. His plan is higher prices, higher prices, higher taxes, lower wages and fewer jobs. That's the Labor way. The Leader of the Opposition is seeking to table the document. No, I seek leave to move the following motion. That the this House has no confidence in the Prime Minister. Yeah. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not oh, granted. Oh, the I move that so much the I the move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving this motion forthwith that this House has no confidence in the Prime Minister. Today Australia has a Prime Minister in name only. 
a Prime Minister without power and a Prime Minister without policies. This is an appalling outcome for the nation. Unbelievably, after yesterday, when we saw how divided the government was, they are more divided today than they were yesterday. The conduct of this narcissistic government is both shocking and selfish and undervalues the Australian people. This House should vote for no confidence because the Prime Minister has no authority, no power and no policies, and the reason for that sits behind him. If nearly half of his own government do not want him to be the Prime Minister of Australia, why should the rest of Australia have to put up with him? The case for no confidence in the Prime Minister has five points to it. If the Prime Minister's own party does not want him, and nearly half of his party voted against him remaining Prime Minister today, why should the parliament put up with him? The second reason, of course, is we saw yesterday the dismal paralysis on policies to lower energy prices and to tackle climate change cannot pass the parliament because this Prime Minister does not have the confidence of all of his backbench. Thirdly, this Prime Minister has never seen a fight for his principles that he hasn't squibbed, and he has notoriously poor judgment, which his backbench and frontbench are willing to tell any journalist anonymously at any time. And fourthly, and even more importantly than the first three reasons, this Prime Minister and his government are ignoring the real challenges of the Australian people, and it means we can have no confidence in him. And finally, the reason why this parliament should have no confidence in the Prime Minister is there are divisions at the heart of this government which cannot be papered over by simply changing the salesman for this government. Turning to the first case for why we should have no confidence in the Prime Minister, we saw today remarkable scenes that yesterday the former Minister for Home Affairs said he supported the Prime Minister until today. For more than just his challenge to the Prime Minister, the fact that 34 other of their colleagues and within 24 hours of the Prime Minister spilling his own position, wanted him gone. This government has lost the will to live. And indeed, what is more significant is that some of the people who voted against the Prime Minister still sit in the executive of this parliament. The members on my left, the Leader of the House, on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on reflection, the government will take the debate with relish. Well, just members on both sides, members on my left, just before I call the Leader of the Opposition. Just to the Leader, leader of the Opposition, it's procedure. I just need you to start back where you were at the very beginning so leave can be granted. Uh, first of all, I move. I move that this House has no confidence in the Prime Minister. Today is, hang on, is, is leave granted? Leave's granted. The leader, the leader of the Opposition has the call. Today it is clear that we have a Prime Minister in name only. He is a Prime Minister without power. He is a Prime Minister without policies. He scraped home at the last election with no authority and no agenda and only the ability to respond to events. But today we have seen an appalling outcome for the nation. It is unbelievable that even though yesterday the Prime Minister said he could not take any action on energy prices because any single member of the government could veto it, today they have highlighted that they are even more divided. This is a government whose conduct is selfish and shocking. It is a narcissistic government consumed with their own jobs and their own struggles, and they've forgotten the people of Australia. The case for no confidence in this Prime Minister can be made through five arguments. The first is if the Prime Minister's own party don't want him, why on earth should the parliament put up with him? Two, we have dismal paralysis on the energy crisis which is affecting Australia, driving up prices, driving up carbon pollution, and no government, no government can retain the confidence of this parliament if they tell us they can't even advance legislation to drive energy prices down. The third proposition why we should have no confidence in this Prime Minister is that the hallmark of his Prime Ministership is that whenever 
his beliefs, meet the, meet the opposition of his backbench. He surrenders his belief, and this parliament should not put up with a prime minister only interested in surviving in his own job. He stands for nothing and fights for nothing except his own job, and his notorious poor judgment is a hallmark which any government backbencher is happy to tell you at length anonymously. But more importantly than the first three reasons which I will go through, there is the fourth. Australians have got real issues and this government is not addressing them, and no amount of valedictory speeches from the Prime Minister can correct that wrong. And finally, the reason why we should have no confidence in this Prime Minister is that your government is hopelessly divided, and it isn't even just about you anymore, Prime Minister. The Liberal government in this country cannot agree with each other on fundamental issues, and a divided government cannot run this as country. Turning to the first proposition, why we should have no confidence in the Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister has nearly half of his MPs who want to change the Prime Minister today, then how on earth should all of us have confidence in him? When you add together the 35 dissidents, soon to be a majority, I suspect, and the 69 Labor MPs and possibly the crossbenchers, a clear majority of Australia does not want this Prime Minister to be the Prime Minister. We have no confidence in him. I noticed that before question time, at least the member for Dixon, who had the integrity to go to the back bench because he couldn't support the Prime Minister on the front bench, he did his job interview, but what was telling and why we should have no confidence in this Prime Minister is five times he was asked was he going to challenge again. He had all the good reasons in the world not to answer that question. So I say to Australians who are shocked by the turmoil in this government, the turmoil is not over until the member for Dixon has the scalp of the Prime Minister hanging from his belt. But what is also telling is that for the 35 MPs who voted for, to change the Prime Minister, some of them sit on the front bench. Some of them sit on the front bench. We had the Minister for Health desperate to replace the Minister for Foreign Affairs until he discovered that the numbers weren't there. Uh, obviously, he's a lot tougher when it comes to swearing at grandmas than it is to challenge the Foreign Minister. And we've got the Member for Deakin, the campaign manager campaign manager for the member for Dixon, sitting quietly there as an assistant minister. Your best days are ahead of you, member for Deakin. But you can only conclude by the cowardice of front bench rebels against the prime minister that the prime minister's weakness is infectious. The prime minister's weakness is infectious, and at least those who vote against the prime minister should have had the courage to say that we'll undermine the government from the back bench, not from the front bench of this government. But I said there was a second reason why we have no confidence in this Prime Minister. The handling of the energy policy by this government alone is a, is a reason why this House should have no confidence. They proposed that we should have initially an emissions intensity scheme. We know that Malcolm, the, the, prime, the current Prime Minister, had a view on that. And we said we were willing to talk about that. But as soon as we come to the dance, the Prime Minister is dragged away by the right wing of his party. Then the Prime Minister rolled out the poor old clean energy target and the chief scientist to advocate it. That didn't last very long. Labor's prepared to be bipartisan. And then the, what we discovered is that when it comes to energy policy, the Prime Minister, when he refers to bipartisanship, means getting the two warring wings of his own party to agree. And then, of course, we've got the much unloved National Energy Guarantee. Neg 1.0, Neg 2.0, Neg 3.0. This is a government whose energy policy is guided by the never-ending panic of a Prime Minister. And the reason why we have no confidence in the Prime Minister is that if he's too weak to legislate policy, if he's too weak to fight for what he believes in, how on earth will we ever lower energy prices in this country? And I do not accept that when the Prime Minister announces mission accomplished on energy prices, when he and his Treasurer and Home Affairs Minister and potential contender for the Prime Minister's position, when they announce that energy prices are coming down, go and talk to real Australians. They just don't agree with you. But this is the real issue, the third issue. We have a Prime Minister whose premiership of the position, his stewardship of the Prime Minister's position, has been marked from day one that he never fights for the principles he believes in. He never understands that when you appease your critics, 
when you surrender your principles, your critics come back and they want more and more, and now they just want your job. Your critics in the Liberal Party and the Conservatives, they can smell the weakness within the Prime Minister. They can sniff the weakness in the Prime Minister. They can see the vulnerability in this Prime Minister. And no matter how many times the Prime Minister changes his views on climate change, no matter how many times he changes his view on the Republic, advocating now the morbid argument that you can't be a Republic until the current Queen passes away, until he keeps giving in. And, the, and let's remember his judgment on the Banking Royal Commission. You have, the Prime Minister has notorious poor judgment because he does not actually fight for anything he believes in. I thought that when this Prime Minister rolled the previous Prime Minister, I thought that we would see a different kind of politics, that we would have a sensible form of politics. I thought my job would be harder. I concede that. But I thought at last we could build a national consensus on climate change, on having an Australian head of state, on actually doing something to look after the middle and working class of this country. But the Prime Minister, having obtained the highest office in the land, we've discovered that he never fights for anything except his own job. And of course, he has notoriously poor judgment. Only someone of Turnbullian genius could argue against the Banking Royal Commission for the last two years. Only this government could have argued in favour of giving the states the right to have income tax powers so there's double income tax in this country. Only this government could still hang on to the corporate Here's tax cuts to this point in the, ele in the electoral cycle. And here's a prediction. This Prime Minister is so afraid of people's reactions to him. He so craves positive polls. He so needs the approval of people that you will drop the corporate tax cuts because you never fight for anything you believe in. And there are real challenges facing the Australian people which deserve to be heard, which are getting neglected under this government, under this narcissistic, selfish, self-obsessed government. And the government MPs, a few of them are yelling out interjections, they know that the people of Australia are more than frustrated with their conduct today. They know they have a government focused on themselves, not on the people of Australia. There are real problems out there in Australian society. Wages are at a record low. I thought I was in a parallel universe last week when the Prime Minister said that wages are getting better. They are at record lows. And if you don't believe me, ask the people who are not getting a pay rise in this country. They don't live like you. They don't live like the people in parliament. Many Australians have not had a pay rise. Many Australians have seen their conditions go back. We have many Australians in casual and part-time work. We have many Australians working in labour hire jobs alongside permanent workers, yet the labour hire workers are paid less. We have many Australians who feel the system is broken. And by the way, the conduct of the government today would give them no reason for optimism that the system is not broken. There are other issues in this country which need to be addressed. One is the unacceptable blowout and waiting lists for aged care. Look at this government. They think they're so clever. Every day the waiting lists get longer, and then you've got to look at the general dismantling of our health care system under a government who'd rather give tax cuts to private health insurance companies rather than rein in the premiums they charge Australians. Then you look at our schools and our TAFE and our universities. This government is not properly funding schools. This government is not properly funding TAFE. This government is not properly funding universities. And when you look at the ranks of this government, some of them perhaps genuinely don't understand these issues. But what chance do some of the backbenchers have when they have a Prime Minister so out of touch? When they have a Prime Minister who gets up every day in question time and says how good things are going? Tell that to the farmers experiencing drought. Tell that to young people who can't get apprenticeships. Tell that to older Australians who can't get the aged care assessment they need to get, into the, to get the support that they require so they can live their remaining years with dignity. And of course, we've got to look at the mess they've made of childcare. A quarter of Australian families are paying more for childcare than they were before this Prime Minister was the Prime Minister. However, it is not just the division, it is not just the fact that this government is out of touch with the real issues of Australia absorbed about themselves. And to be fair to the Prime Minister, it's not all his fault alone. 
The problem is that the Liberal Party of Australia is not the Liberal Party they once were. It is riven by fundamental disagreements at the heart of the government. That is why the member for Dixon feels the need to speak up for the Conservatives. That is why so many of the brave anonymous assassins of, Malcolm, of the Prime Minister over there say that this government is somehow not living up to Conservative standards. This is a government at war with itself. And as much as they may say it's not, as much as they say they are economic supermen making Australia better for all, of the, better for all Australians, the fact of the matter is this is a government who is desperate to survive. We know, members of the backbench and brave members of the front bench, we know that when you drop your silly corporate tax cuts, we know that that is a battle won by Labor, but we know that war is not over. We are determined. The best way to stop corporate tax cuts in this country is to vote Labor at the next election. Look at the way this government has pursued the ABC. The old Liberal Party, the party of Fraser and Menzies, would not have attacked the ABC. Now we have the job specification of the Minister for Communications to be a serial complainant about the ABC. And of course, we see the ongoing debates about school funding. The best way to look after the government schools, the Catholic schools and independent schools is not to rob Peter to pay Paul, but to properly fund all schools based upon need. And this is a government who loves to talk about big stick. In the game of question time bingo, yesterday this government had the big stick on energy companies, the big stick on banks. The problem is, at the same time, they're trying to legislate tax cuts for the very companies they say they're tough on. The real problem in Australia at the moment is that this Prime Minister is simply not up to the job. And no amount of you know, uh, mogadon behaviour at press conferences after leadership changes can un unmake this truth. The reality is, Prime Minister, you have 35 people behind you who this morning voted not to have you as their leader. And I predict that number will get larger. Today, you may well have all the government members vote to have confidence in you, but doesn't that just show the parallel world in which this parliament has descended? This morning, 35 of your colleagues, who you thought were your great supporters, voted to do you in. And Thursday, or in two weeks' time, or after the next poll, which you worship so foolishly, what will then happen? What will then happen is more of them will do you in. So let us be done with the dishonesty that this parliament has confidence in the Prime Minister. Your colleagues don't want you. You've exercised notoriously poor judgment because you are as weak a Prime Minister we've seen since Billy McMahon. You are a dismal failure when it comes to energy policy, telling us it's not your fault, it's the fault of individual members of your government. You have no idea how the real people live. You are hopelessly out of touch with their views. And finally and fundamentally, you lead a divided government, and nothing you can do will change that fact. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. If the Prime Minister wants to second the Is motion. Is the motion seconded or the, will we the motion's, the, the motion's seconded and I reserve my right to speak. The Prime Minister has the well, uh, well, thank you, Mr Speaker. So, so we have that tirade from the Leader of the Opposition. The man who, as a union leader, sold out his members again and again. He was prepared to exchange penalty rates for cleaners in return for a deal, a secret deal with the employer with money going back to the union. This is a great leader, we're told, wants to be Prime Minister. He voted against making payments between large companies and unions transparent. Can you believe that? He's actually in favour of secret and corrupting payments. He didn't want them to be banned. He didn't want the public to know the members of unions to know about it. One deal after another behind the back of the men and women he was supposed to represent. And Mr Speaker, right through this parliament, we have been able, despite his negativity, we've been able to deliver one great economic step in advancing the interests of hard-working Australian families. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't seem to care that last year we had the largest jobs growth in Australia's history, the largest jobs growth in any single year, over 400,000 jobs. And we have, Mr. Speaker, economic growth which is now faster, higher than any of the G7 economies. So economic management is a key priority for governments. There you are, highest jobs growth, high economic growth. And employment, Mr Speaker. We have now unemployment at its lowest level since November 2012. Now, we want to see it lower and we want to see wages growth higher. But what we are doing is delivering stronger economic growth, more jobs, lower unemployment. And what that will deliver, as the Reserve Bank was saying only today, is higher wages, and we are starting to see that movement in higher wages. It all comes from a stronger economy. Now that, Mr Speaker, the for we've been able to do at the same time as we have reduced taxes for Australians, Australian families, we have introduced and passed through the House, with the one-seat majority he reminds me of regularly, through the Senate, where we are in a minority, the largest personal income tax reform in 20 years. So hard-working Australian families, middle-income taxpayers, are getting $530 back each during this current financial year. The and by 2024, we will see 94 per cent of Australians paying no more than 32 and a half cents on any extra dollar they earn. And Mr Speaker, we also have succeeded, and this is a vital priority, in being able to bring down youth unemployment to its lowest level since April 2012. More than 57,000 young Australians found a job in the 12 months to July this year. Now that is again a reminder of what a strong economy does. You get more economic growth, more investment, more jobs. And the female participation rate is at record levels. And so, Mr Speaker, we hear from the Leader of the Opposition his complaints about economic management, stronger economic growth than any of the G7 economies, record jobs growth, the lowest unemployment rate since 2012, the lowest youth unemployment rate since 2012, the highest female participation rate, that is what you get from a strong economy, and that is what we're delivering. Now, Mr Speaker, we're delivering, we have delivered lower taxes for small and medium Australian businesses. Now, these are overwhelmingly family-owned businesses, and these are businesses turning over less than $50 million a year, which employ over half the private sector workforce. So these are not big companies. These are not giant multinationals, but they are employing millions of Australians, and they are employing more of them because of our reforms. Now, Mr Speaker, the honourable member refers to energy. Well, let's be quite clear about this. The Labor Party's policies on energy are a repeat of policies that have failed. They want to have a 50 per cent renewable energy target when we know the renewable energy target was a mistake. It is widely recognised as such, called out by the ACCC. What it did, what it did was displace dispatchable power and resulted in huge amounts of renewable power, regardless of what it did to the reliability of the system. And the member for Port Adelaide knows all about that because he comes from South Australia, where energy is its most expensive and its least reliable. Now, what we're committed to doing is delivering cheaper power. Prices fell in the June quarter 1.3 per cent, not a huge fall, but they're coming down. And we've seen lower prices quoted by retailers for the current quarter. The new default market offer that we are going to establish based on the recommendation from the ACCC inquiry which we initiated will result in substantial savings for consumers and for businesses. For consumers, up to $416 a year, and for businesses, small businesses, $1,457 a year. Now, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the Honourable Member on my right. uh, talked about funding for health 
and, uh, and uh, hospitals. We are spending record amounts in every area of health, health, hospitals, Medicare, PBS. When new life-saving drugs are recommended by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, we list them. We don't have to do as Labor did and postpone their listing because they couldn't afford to do so. A stronger economy enables you to do all that. We have increased bulk billing rates. They're now at record levels. 86.1 per cent of all GP services are bulk billed. So Labor wants to repeat the Medi-Scare lies that they have run at the last election and every by-election. But the reality is every public hospital in Australia is receiving more funding under our government than it did under Labor. And Mr Speaker, in terms of schools, again, the Labor lies are rolled out. We're spending a record $249.8 billion over the next 10 years on schools, and we've cleaned up Labor's 27 special deals that saw students in one state getting less funding in another. And, Mr Speaker, in terms of national security, Labor neglected our defence forces. They did not commission one new naval ship in their whole time in office. We have 53 vessels either under construction or under design, and that is because we are determined to keep Member Australia safe and we are able to pay for it because of the stronger economy that delivers stronger government revenues and enables us, in addition to doing all that, to bring the budget back into balance a year earlier. Now, the alternative that Labor offers is an abandonment of every principle and value the Labor Party used to stand for. The Labor Party used to stand for aspiration. No, not anymore. It's a mystery. They used to stand for people getting ahead and having a go. Not anymore. We have the politics of envy being rolled out in every electorate around the country. Labor is going after small businesses, family-owned businesses. It's going after businesses, no matter how small they are, it wants them to pay more tax. It's going after individual taxpayers. It's going after retirees. I heard the Leader of the Opposition talk about self-funded retirees. Well, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is going after their savings. Anyone with a portfolio in that, that uh, type of uh, investor, a self-funded retiree, will have a portfolio with Australian shares in it. The Labor Party wants to take away 30 per cent of their income, a cash grab that will leave all of those families short. That's the, that's the Labor approach, going after families, going after self-funded retirees, going after businesses and with energy policies that can have only one result, which is higher and higher energy prices. Now, we are taking action to defend Australian families, get taxes down, electricity prices down, jobs up, investment up, the energetic economic growth that we need, which results in higher wages, as we are starting to see. That's our commitment. We're standing up for the Australian families, the Australian workers, that the Leader of the Opposition abandoned in his union career and now abandons in this chamber. Members on my left, the question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this parliament has no confidence in this Prime Minister. You know that no one on this side has confidence in the Prime Minister, and what we also know is half the people on the other side have no confidence in this Prime Minister. And if they weren't such lions in the party room and lambs or sheep in here, then they would join us in voting on this motion that this parliament has no confidence in this Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, this horror, show, this horror show has gone on long enough because it's bad for the country and it's bad for Australian families to have a government so divided, so unable to govern. Australians are sick to death of it. They're sick of power prices and pollution going up. They're sick of wages flatlining. They're sick of the cuts to health and education. They're sick of the chaos in aged care and childcare. They're sick of it. And all this while, all the Liberals can do is focus on themselves, focus on their own ambitions.
today the Prime Minister is boasting about what, such, what a great job he's doing. He's doing such a great job. Why did half his colleagues vote against yeah. him today? Yeah. And of course he goes straight to attacking the Leader of the Opposition for his background as a union leader. Well, I tell you what, I would stand beside someone who spent his working life defending Australian working people before I would stand beside someone who spent his life as a merchant Labor is united. Labor stands ready to govern because for five years now we have shown unity and we have shown discipline. Under the leadership of the Leader of the Opposition, we have the better policies and we have the better people. And you saw it in those by-elections that the Prime Minister said were a test of leadership. As it happens, yes, they were a test of leadership, weren't they? We have the better policies in tax, bigger tax cuts for low- and middle-income Australians, millions of them, almost twice as well off under Labor's tax policies. Health, education, industrial relations, environment, energy, climate change, better policies in all of these areas than the government because they're so busy focusing on themselves. Well, um, uh, the foreign minister interjects, where's the money coming from? Well, we're not giving $80 billion in big business tax cuts, are we? We're not giving tax cuts to the top end of town, are we? That's where the money comes from. You know what we found yesterday, what we heard yesterday, is the Prime Minister confirming that it doesn't matter who's sitting at the dispatch box, it's the member for Warringah calling the shots, because the member for Warringah has right of veto over every government policy. What a position to be in. And you know what? Next it will be the member for Dixon. The member for Dixon sitting on the lap of the member for Warringah like a really scary wooden puppet come to life with the hand of the member for Warringah up his um, back. Yeah, he's, he's back. He's, he's back like Chucky. He's back like Glenn Close in Fatal Attraction. That's right. And what's the alternative? The member for Dixon, the, the member for Dixon voted by doctors to be the worst health minister in 40 years. What a record. Cut $50 billion from our hospitals, cut hundreds of millions from preventive health, from dental care, cut his way through the health portfolio, took on immigration and has presided over an abject failure in over five years to find new homes for those people, including children, on Madison Nauru, who should have had permanent homes before now. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a Frankenstein's monster of a government. It has the face of the member for Wentworth, it has the policies of the member for Warringah, and it has the cold, shrivelled soul of the member for Dixon. A Frankenstein's government, Frankenstein's monster of a government. In five years, five years they've had what actually is their energy policy now? What is their energy policy? What is their tax policy when they dump their company tax cuts? What's their education policy? What's their health policy? In five years they've had to come up with a plan for this nation and all they've done is fight amongst themselves like a bunch of children. We've agreed, Mr Deputy Speaker, to keep it to five minutes on, uh, on each side, so I'm going to end with this. This parliament, this, parliament right. this chaos can only be resolved with an election because the parliament has no confidence in this Prime Minister. We don't, most of you don't, and we are united. We are ready to govern. The question is that the members on my left Members on my left, the question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. We reject this motion outright, Mr Speaker. We've got confidence in the Prime Minister. But we know a few things. We know a few things about this opposition leader. We know that he stands for higher taxes. We know that he and his party stand for higher energy prices. And look at look at the sorry lot behind him. I mean we've got the member for Watson. 
Let's, let's not forget, people haven't got that short a memory to, to recall what Labor stood for when it was in power. And the member for Watson, he wanted to take the water rights, the irrigation rights, away from my farmers, away from farmers right throughout river communities in Australia. That's what he stood for. And then we had the member for McMahon. Remember all of those boats? Well, look at the member for McMahon's face. His was the face that launched hundreds of ships. That's right, hundreds of ships. They came. There were 55,000 people who arrived unauthorised, and he was responsible for a lot of those. There were 1,200 deaths at sea, and that was tragic. There were 800 boats. Labor put more beds in detention centres than they ever did than they ever did in hospitals. And then we move along. We move along to the, the member, member for Port Adelaide. Adelaide. What, what a sorry figure. He described recently the blackouts in South Australia, which had so much caused so much despair for businesses, for families throughout South Australia, as nothing more than a hiccup. That's right, nothing more than a hiccup. Member for Bass let's will not, leave under 94. Let's own. not forget the member for Rankin. He was the chief of staff of the member for Lilly, who stood here, who stood at this very spot and said, "The four years of surpluses I announced tonight." Where are those four years of surpluses? That's why this nation is in so much trouble, because of the member for Lilly. And thank goodness he's still here, because every time we look at him, we can remind ourselves of the debt and despair that Labor, in six sorry years, plunged this nation into. That's right. And then we've got the member for Shortland. The member for Shortland and the member for Hunter. They should listen more to the member for Patterson. She sounded them out recently. She did. She stuck up the coal workers. She stuck up the coal mines. She stuck up the coal-fired power stations. Good on you, member for Patterson. Come out of this way. Come out of this way. We believe you. We believe you. I tell you what, it's a shame the member for Shortland and the member for Hunter don't, because they don't stand up. They don't stand up for coal workers. I tell you what our people do. We stand up for coal workers. We stand up for all workers, because that's what we do. That's why we're lowering. That's why we're lowering the company tax rate. We're getting it down to 25 per cent. What does, what does the member for Merriman want to do? He wants to push it up well beyond 30 per cent. That's what Labor stands for. They don't stand. They don't stand up for workers. I mean, look at look at the member for Marimanong's record. Chiquita mushrooms, clean event. I mean, really, he sold those union members out. He did. And rest assured, if he gets the opportunity as Prime Minister, he'll do it again. But don't you start, Member for Edmund Era. Why haven't you stood up? Why members haven't you stood sides. up for those for those for the ships? When Labor, when Labor in, they did not give a ship. They did not build a ship. Not one ship did Labor build in six years. And we're getting on with the job. We're Member spending for billions, billions on our defence program to make sure that our national security is what it ought to be. But what did Labor do? What did the Labor member for Edmund Eyre has warned. They lowered the amount of spending on defence to its lowest level since, as, as a ratio to GDP since 1938. And we all know what happened in 1939. But what else did Labor do? But what else did Labor do? What else did Labor do? I tell you what they did. They, they shut down the live cattle trade to Indonesia. But did they tell Indonesia, one of our great trading partners? No, they didn't. They had to read it in the media. Labor does not stand up for the regions. We proudly do. And we're standing up for them at the moment. They're drought stricken. I appreciate that uh, that is a concern of all members of parliament, but we are standing up for those drought stricken farmers. And they must watch this debate and they must think, well, what an unedifying member spectacle for that is. is they, must think, they must think, well, why are Labor carrying on like this? Why are Labor? They should be standing up for the farming communities, standing up for workers, standing up for low energy costs standing up for workers and families and all the things that are important to Australia. But they're not. They're not. We are. And we certainly will continue to do that. And we've got the back of the Prime Minister and the back of the Australian people. Thank you. Members on both sides, the question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. I call the Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, 35 of them have the back of the Prime Minister. There's no doubt about that. 
knives in the back of the Prime Minister that 35 of them have. If there was a moment, if there was a moment in the speech of the Prime Minister that really said it all, it was when he started to talk about somebody abandoning their principles. Because there is no one in this chamber who has a record of anything they claim being a high point of principle ultimately being doomed the way this Prime Minister does. He told us he believed in the Republic and it was doomed. He told us that you could trust the banks and that argument was doomed. He told us he believed in an emissions intensity scheme. Doomed. Then he begged that we support a clean energy target. Doomed. Then he said we needed to support his national energy guarantee. Doomed. And then he told us he was passionate about his big business tax cuts. Doomed again. Because this man now believes that his party will continue to stand beside him. Doomed. It's not going to happen. And no one believes it's going to happen. We've all seen this movie before, and we've all watched the member for Dixon while this debate's been on, furiously doing a bit of writing and then doing a bit of texting back and forth to his colleagues. And I'll tell you, if he only had 35 votes at the beginning of this debate, we can only imagine what he's got after the Prime Minister's speech. Because as this debate goes on, we all know where it's headed. And it's a choice. It's a choice here between somebody who has always abandoned what he said he was passionate about and somebody who has always been passionate about the worst possible things. Because the choice—I mean, think of this, Prime Minister. The person who nearly half of your colleagues prefer was the author of the GP tax. The person who nearly half of your colleagues prefer is the person who cut $50 billion from hospitals. The person who nearly half of your colleagues prefer is the person who axed national dental programs and who was voted by doctors as the worst health minister for 50 years. Because whereas this Prime Minister looks at his beliefs and says, oh no, I'll throw that one away, I'll throw that one away, don't need to believe in that, any member of the backbench can have a right of veto over anything, no matter how important I said it was, the alternative is somebody who always has looked at the policies of both the Abbott government and the Turnbull government, as we now move to the new riff of the Abbott-Turnbull-Dutton government, that's going to be the new riff that we're heading to. This is going to be somebody who sees a government that cuts penalty rates and says that's not extreme enough. Somebody who sees cutting funding to schools and says that's not extreme enough. Cutting funding to hospitals, they just haven't cut far enough. Government cuts to the pension, on the books here ever since the 2014 budget, just not going hard enough an NBN that they make slower, that comes later, that's more expensive. They just won't have wrecked it enough. The man who says giving $17 billion to the banks, they just haven't gone far enough. A choice between a man who abandons his principles and one whose views are so extreme he boycotted the national apology. That's what they debated this morning. That's the choice that is driving this government in half between somebody who stands for nothing and somebody who stands for all the worst possible principles. And all they know when it comes to it is not what they believe. All they know is who they hate. I mean, the press conference to justify why the Liberal Party fell apart this morning, when the member for Dixon went and gave that media conference, he started reiterating his CV, telling us all the wonderful things that he'd done. And then he got to the reason why he just had to challenge. The reason he gave was the Leader of the Opposition. They will blame the Labor Party for everything, including this morning's leadership challenge. The Australian people don't care that you hate Labor, but the Australian people do care that you hold them in contempt. And this government shows that they hold the Australian people in contempt when people are paying for the division of this government every day. They pay for the division in this government when they pay for the increased costs in health care. They pay for the division in this government when they pay for their increasing energy bills. They pay for the division in this government when they pay for the fact that everything goes up except their wages and the government comes here and votes against protecting their penalty rates. This government, under this Prime Minister, has let the Australian people down all the time. 
And yes, now they've added they don't just hate the Labor Party, they hate each other too. That's no way to govern this country. Yeah. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The Minister for Foreign Affairs has the call. Members on my left. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Turnbull government is delivering for the people of Australia through lower taxes, lower prices and more jobs. We are fighting for the people of Australia because we have an economic plan to grow our economy and ensure there are more jobs and more job opportunities. We are the party that backs the small businesses, the mums and dads who take a risk, who start a business, who grow a business and who export their goods and services around the world. These are the people that the coalition government right. back to drive our economic growth and create jobs for the Australian people. That's why the Turnbull government is backing small business, medium-sized business, through tax cuts. That's why we are fighting for lower costs, our energy plan to bring down the cost of electricity so that our businesses can compete around the world. That's why we have a plan to fix the That's GST right. so that there's a level playing field across Australia yeah, yeah. for all businesses who are operating this, in this country. Mr Speaker, we have turned the corner on Labor's debt. We will return the budget to surplus a year early in 2019-2020. In Do you know the last time a Labor government delivered a budget surplus? The last time Labor delivered a budget surplus, the Berlin Wall was still standing. Ronald Reagan was still in the White House. Maggie Thatcher was still in Downing Street. Bob Hawke was in the lodge. Back in 1920, back 25 years ago, was the last time that Labor delivered a surplus. So what we've done is we've fixed the economic mess that we inherited. Now remember. When Labor came into government, remember the six years of Labor, they blew a $20 billion surplus and never delivered one. They blew billions and billions of dollars in savings. We went from zero, zero net government debt to massive debt. And in the six years of the coalition government, we're turning the corner on Labor's debt and we're getting back into surplus. Now, did these things have an effect on our economy? Yes, they did. For a start, because of Labor's economic mismanagement, they cut defence spending to the lowest level since 1938. Right. Not one new naval vessel commissioned for our Navy. Not only did that put at risk thousands and thousands of jobs in the defence industry supply chain, it put our national security at risk. Then we inherited the mess of the NBN off Labor. In their entire six years, they only connected 50,000 households. In six years, 50,000. We are connecting 50,000 every two weeks. So every two weeks, we achieve more than Labor did in their entire six years. And what else did Labor do through its mismanagement of the economy? They stopped listing life-saving drugs on the PBS. They stopped listing drugs because we have now fixed the budget because we have now paid off the labour debt peak, we are now, we are now being able to list life-saving drugs on the PBS, and at last count it was 1,800 new drugs listed on the PBS. But, members, the greatest policy failure in a generation on Labor's part, and believe me, there's a big list, so I don't say this lightly, the greatest policy failure of Labor was losing control of our borders right. and inspiring the people smuggling trade. 50,000 boats, 50,000 people, 800 boats, thousands of children in detention centres across Australia and in our region under Labor. 1,200 deaths at sea that we know of. And that's why, through our Operation Sovereign Borders, we restored integrity to our sovereignty to our borders and we put the people smugglers out of business. So, Mr Speaker, under the policies of the Turnbull government, we now have the fastest growing economy in all of the G7s. We're growing faster than all the G7s. We're growing faster than New Zealand. We're growing faster than South Korea. We have created an environment that has seen 300,000 
new jobs created in the last 12 months, a thousand new jobs a day under this government. Unemployment is now 5.3 per cent. That's lower than, say, Canada. It's still too high, but that's why we're working night and day to ensure we can get that unemployment rate down. It's the lowest for six years, but it's going lower. And where does Labor get its inspiration from? Venezuela. Higher taxes, higher inflation, lower jobs growth. The coalition stands for the workers. Yeah. Yeah. The members on my left, member for Whitlam and Chefley. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The member for McMahon has the question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There were sighs of relief when the member for Wentworth became Prime Minister of Australia, but for the last three years there have been groans of disappointment, as the Australian people have expressed the view that 35 of his colleagues expressed today that this man is simply not up to the task. This is a Prime Minister without principle and without power. He's betrayed every principle he's ever had, and yesterday he gave away his power. He said any Liberal or National Party MP who crosses the floor will mean that the government can't implement policy. He vacated policy leadership to the climate change deniers and the extreme right wing of his party. And how did they thank him? With a midnight knock at the door, Mr. Mr. Speaker, a midnight knock at the door. This is a Prime Minister who has lost the confidence of his colleagues and long ago lost the confidence of the people. Now, the, the Leader of the Opposition and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition have pointed out that this Prime Minister does not have the confidence of the House. It's a statement of fact. We have no confidence in him. 35 of his colleagues have no confidence in him. The National Party didn't get a vote. We know they don't have confidence in him. But there's an even better reason to carry this motion, because the carrying of a motion of no confidence will oblige this Prime Minister to hop in the car, to go down to the Governor-General and to advise an election, and let the Australian people cast their judgment on this man and on this government, to make way for a government with unity of purpose and unity of agenda. That's why this motion should be carried. That's why this motion should be carried, because the Australian people deserve to have their say, to have their judgment on this Prime Minister. Now, we should remember, as his colleagues remembered today, what this Prime Minister's case for election was. He said to his colleagues that they'd lost 30 news polls and that he could provide better economic leadership. Now, I pointed out on the Alan Jones program this week that he'd lost 37 news polls. I was corrected by Mr Jones's 38. And then we have the new economic leadership that he promised. This is a Prime Minister who has a one-point economic plan, giving away $80 billion in corporate tax cuts. Now That one-point plan will die an unlamented death in the other place later this afternoon. And when that plan dies, this Prime Ministership should die with it. When that plan is defeated, this Prime Minister should be defeated with it, because this Prime Minister had one idea give $80 billion to big business and let it trickle down. He had one idea. That was his answer to low wages growth, to cut wages through letting penalty rates be cut and to cut taxes for big business in the hope and the forlorn prayer that it be allowed to trickle down to the workers of Australia. This is a man without an agenda other than that one-point plan. This is a man who, as energy prices have risen, has in fairness had many plans had the National Energy Guarantee, had the Clean Energy Target, had the Emissions Intensity Scheme, none of which have survived contact with the enemy, Mr Speaker, and by the enemy I mean those sitting behind him. None of those plans have withstood the scrutiny of the House and they haven't even been brought into a vote for a vote because they have not withstood the scrutiny of his colleagues. This is a man whose big idea was to increase the GST and then allow state income taxes, a man who has not had the courage of his convictions to follow through his economic beliefs and put them to the test. The member for Warringa put it well last night as he left the parliament. He said, the question now is, what are the principles of this prime minister? What are the convictions of this prime minister? What does this man stand for? Well, what an epitaph for this prime minister, that his predecessor has asked the question, what does he stand for? The answer, of course, is very, very little. 
other than his own survival. Well, his colleagues worked it out today. His colleagues expressed a view today, 35 of them, and they now have the opportunity to vote accordingly. And the House now has the opportunity to say what his colleagues have said to him today. You have stayed too long for any good you have done. The time has come for you to depart. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. I call the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, they're very cocky, aren't they? They're very cocky. They're very, very cocky. It was the Leader of the Opposition who said, just leave the keys to the lodge there in the door. That's what he said. And as they would have heard those words from the Leader of the Opposition, I reckon a chill would have gone through Australians. A chill would have gone through Australians, and for two very important reasons. Australians do not trust a potential shortened government to run a stronger economy or to keep Australians safe. They know that they will not be safe under a shortened led government. They know that their jobs, their wages, the fiscal strength of this government, the AAA credit rating, the future they hope for will not be safe under a potential shortened government. But they can trust the Turnbull government. They can trust the Turnbull government. They can trust the Liberal and National parties because our plan for a stronger economy is working and our plan for a safer Australia is working, Mr Speaker. Our plan is ensuring that unemployment is going down, jobs are going up. We have had 95,500 young people get a job in the last fiscal year, the best result in 30 years, and that deserves a strong cheer, Mr Speaker. That's what that deserves. We get none of them from that side, Mr Speaker, because there are jobs being created in this economy under the plan, under the plan of this government. Debt has turned the corner. The deficit is falling and will return to balance next year. The AAA credit rating has been ensured and kept under this government, and thuggish unions and big companies who want to take people for a ride have we have put in the powers and are putting in the powers to stop them in their tracks, Mr. Speaker, while this leader of the opposition cheers them all on. On top of that, Mr Speaker, our plan for keeping Australians safe is working. It is this government, it is this government, a Liberal national government, that is legislating to protect Australians from foreign interference. It is this government, it is these parties that has put in place the funding to restore our national security agencies, our police officers, our border protection, and, to, and, and the ABCC has been put in there to put a real cop on the beat to keep the union thugs off the, or off the leash under a short lead government, but certainly not under this government. Mr. Speaker, our defence forces are being rebuilt after the waste and the neglect of the Labor Party, who let them run down to the lowest level since pre-war times, Mr. Speaker, and they should be ashamed of that. But, Mr. Speaker, it is also this government that has been protecting not only our values but has been protecting our borders, and we ended the absolute chaos and wreckage that came, particularly from the shadow treasurer. The shadow treasurer, when he was the worst immigration minister in this country's the history, worst. the worst, the and he worst. made the biggest contribution to 800 boats, 50,000 people, more than 6,000 children in detention, every single one of them, including those who supported it otherwise from the Greens, should hang their heads in shame for the human carnage and wreckage they were responsible for and the lives they destroyed by their neglect, Mr. Speaker. We've been talking about a big stick to take to energy companies. This mob couldn't find a big stick with a flashlight and two pair of hands, Mr. Speaker. Under them, there'll be no stick. The unions will be off the leash. The big companies will be off the leash, Mr. Speaker. They will run away under the weakness of this government. But more important than that, Mr. Speaker, more important than the strong policies we have is the strong beliefs that underpin those policies. The fair go for those who have a go, Mr. Speaker. The fair go for those who have a go, who put in the hard yards. That's what our tax cuts have been about for personal income tax, for small business, for farmers, for all of them, Mr. Speaker. Fair go for those who have a go, ensuring that we reject 
the disgraceful politics of envy championed by this leader of the Labor Party. We don't think, Mr Speaker, for you to do better, someone has to do worse. The punishing taxes of this potential shortened government all Australians will, will recoil from. $5 billion a year of a slug on retirees, on pensioners, on those who have worked hard, small businesses. That's what this fella has ensured for them if he is elected. And we have an immigration policy that brings people to this country who want to make a contribution, not take one. We have a policy to ensure that the best form of welfare is a job. We don't think tax is a privilege. We think it is a burden, Mr Speaker, which should be eased on all of the Australian people who work hard. And when it comes to our sovereign interests, this side of the House always believes we will decide. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to, and I call the member for Grindler. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, there were two words missing from the speeches of those opposing this motion of no confidence in this Prime Minister. What were those two words? Prime Minister. <laughs> Not one of the speakers has defended Malcolm Turnbull's Prime Ministership. These speeches today are typical of what has characterised this government, or should I say this opposition in exile, because what they have done, what they have done is turn the coalition into the noalition. They seek to define themselves by what they're against, not by what they're for, and that is why they have nothing less than a crisis of identity, a crisis of belief between the views of the current Prime Minister and the views of the past and future Prime Ministers. And that is why they have such a problem, because you can't define themselves by just what you're against. We know when they stand up and talk about the reason why they should stay on the Treasury benches, they speak about a tax on trade unions, a tax on public education, a tax on public health, a tax on the pro public broadcaster. They speak about a tax against the Leader of the Opposition and all of our team. They don't present an actual vision for how they will take the country forward. And it's there in their policies. And we should have seen it, because when the current Prime Minister took over, as communications minister, he actually does get, he actually does get the interweb thingy. He gets it. <laughs> Unlike, as 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 his predecessor said, he invented it. But what's he done? 21 million metres of copper wire in the 21st century. That is what he has done. So last century, when it comes to climate change. He gets that too. But he puts forward the emissions intensity scheme but can't follow it through. Then he gets the chief scientist to come up with a policy. So the chief scientist comes up with one, the clean energy target. We say, oh, well, we'll have a look at that. That looks OK. Then it disappears. And then we have various versions of the NEG, the National Energy Guarantee. And he walks away from that as well. He says he supports infrastructure and public transport. He loves taking selfies on trains and trams. We don't want selfies. People want trains and trams funded with dollars. The Melbourne Metro, the Cross River Rail. No, that's not good enough. He'll go to Melbourne, he'll go to Brisbane, he'll go to openings of Redcliffe Rail. He just won't fund rail lines in inner Brisbane. The fact is that this motion should be carried because we know that there is a majority who support this motion—69 on this side, 35 on that side. That's before we get to the Nats. That's before we get to Barnaby's mob. They're not part of that. So you're up to 104. You're in triple Member figures. For Grayler will, <laughs> Member for Grayler will refer to people by their correct Before goals. you get to the cross benches or before you get to the National Party. The fact is, under this Leader of the Opposition, we have been working to have a plan for government. We have put forward economic policy. We have put forward really difficult tax changes under this shadow treasurer. We have put forward 
policies to give fairness in the workplace. We have put forward environmental policies. We understand that Australians want nothing more and nothing less than for their kids to have more opportunity in life than they had, and they want an environment to be inherited that's better than the ones that we enjoy. But instead of that, instead of that true aspiration, which isn't for another yacht, the aspiration of Australians is for their family, for their community and for their country. Instead, what we've got is the selfish attitude of those opposite. And then the, uh, the Treasurer at the moment had the, had the gumption to speak about the big stick. Now, myself and the next speaker get to talk every Friday morning early. And last week I said the problem was they're using the big stick on themselves. <laughs> well, I was wrong, Mr. Speaker, because now they're using it on each other. And we saw it this morning. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to, and I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this motion should be defeated, Mr. Speaker, because this House does have confidence in the Prime Minister of Australia, the member for Wentworth, Mr. Speaker. The, the, this yeah. motion my should left. be voted against because this House and this government has confidence in the Prime Minister, the member for Wentworth, Mr. Speaker. And this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, welcomes a debate about character, Mr. Speaker. We are more than happy to fight the next election on the character of the Prime Minister versus the character of the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker. Because this, this Leader Member of the Opposition Burt, is a political back. fraud, Mr Speaker. He is a political fraud. He just gave a speech dripping with hypocrisy, dripping with bitterness, a venomous, vicious, vituperative speech from a man that nobody on his side of the House trusts, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition has left a trail of destruction behind him throughout his political career, Mr Speaker. This is a man his colleagues do not trust, Mr Speaker. This is a man who needs the CFMMEU to break up meetings of the ALP in Victoria to protect himself from his own members, Mr Speaker. Right. This Leader of the Opposition is prepared to bring union thugs into every single forum of the Labor Party in Victoria to control pre-selections, to control policy outcomes, to give them two and a half million dollars worth of donations. And why, Mr. Speaker? Because this leader of the opposition always puts himself first ahead of every single other person. He has a list of victims class. as long as your arm, Mr. Speaker. Not just within the former Labor Party caucus. Not just. People like Bob Sirkham, the former member for Maribyrnong, who was cut down by the Leader of the Opposition in his own electorate. Or Gavin O'Connor, the former member for Corio, Mr Speaker. He got in the way. He had to be dispatched by the Leader of the Opposition so that his friends could get seats. But worst of all was when they tried to take out Simon Crean, one of the doyens of the Labor Party in Victoria, a former Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition's faction had to take him out because he got in the way of this man's quest for power, Mr Speaker. This man's quest for power was so low that he was prepared to take the penalty rates away from the lowest paid workers in Australia, That's right. from cleaners, Mr That's Speaker, right. from clean events. Right. This was a man That's who thought the cleaners of Australia are, are vulnerable and I can get some benefit out of them. I can get an advantage out of them. And do you know what the advantage was, Mr Speaker? Lists so he could increase his power in the ALP. Cash so he could buy more memberships within the ALP and pre-selection power in the Victorian ALP. And the poor old workers at Clean Event, they were the ones that had to suffer. They were the ones that had to go without their penalty rates. And this is a man who comes in and gives speeches about penalty rates. But that wasn't enough, of course. It was the workers at Chiquita Mushrooms got exactly the same treatment, Mr Speaker. The workers at Chiquita Mushrooms, they were dispatchable as well. They were dispatchable along with the cleaners from Clean Event, Mr Speaker. And of course, other leaders of the, of the Labor Party, they couldn't trust him either. Julia Gillard couldn't trust him. Kevin Rudd didn't trust him. And it was written about in Paul Kelly's book. Paul Kelly wrote, the distrust between Rudd and Shorten was intense and enduring. The Gillard camp was contemptuous of Shorten considering him weak and duplicitous. That's one thing she got right. 
Neither side trusted him, and neither side revised its view, Mr. Speaker. So if the Leader of the Opposition wants an election on character, we'll take it every day, because this side of the House backs the Prime Minister of Australia, the member for Wentworth, Mr Speaker. The worst subject you could possibly fight an election on would be character, Mr Speaker. If you decide to have an election around character, we'll, put it, we'll line up our Prime Minister against your Leader of the Opposition every single day, Mr Speaker. Because we know what we stand for. We stand for lower taxes. We stand for families. We stand for farmers. We stand for balancing the budget. We stand for putting more money into infrastructure and industry. And that's why this side of the House has governed for two thirds of the last 70 years. Because our values are the values of the Australian people. They are the values of the Australian people, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we've won six of the last eight elections. And that's why we're going to win the next one next year. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. Order the question is the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Lawler and Morton tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Capricornia and Gray tell us for the noes. Order the result of the, of the ballot is division, I should say, is ayes 67, no 76. <laughs> the Prime Minister. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. I thank the Prime Minister. I present the Auditor General's performance audit report number two of 2018-19 entitled Administration of the Data Retention Industry Grants Program, Attorney General's Department. And there are no papers today, so if people are leaving the chamber, if they could do that as fast as possible. I'm about to call on the matter of public importance.